you very much, uh, Mary, for inviting me, and thank you for the Brain Conference. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, my name is Luis Carola. I'm from Barcelona, Spain, and I'm going to talk about autoantibodies in inflammatory neuropathies. These are my disclosures. And uh, the inflammatory neuropathies are a heterogeneous group of, of neuropathies, and uh, we can classify them in acute and chronic uh, neuropathies. And the two paradigmatic examples are the Guillain-Barré syndrome spectrum of disorders and, and the CDP spectrum of disorders. And as you can see, uh, they are uh, not only uh, heterogeneous from the clinical uh, perspective, but also in the pathogenetic uh, perspective. Uh, we can find different mechanisms uh, leading to a similar uh, phenotype in these disorders. The reviews in the field, the, the last reviews in the field, acknowledge that there are no biomarkers that are good to diagnose or at least to subclassify these disorders in order to find better or more precise therapies. Uh, the diagnosis is still based on clinical and electrophysiological criteria, and although we have uh, found uh, the several antibodies uh, that may be used also for a diagnosis, there still is a need to, to keep going in today's direction. One thing that these disorders have in common, both in the, in the chronic and in the acute versions, is that they respond to immune therapies and they usually respond to similar immune therapies, for example, to plasma exchange or to intravenous immunoglobulins. And this is, I'm using here the GBS and, and CDP as paradigmatic examples, but it, this also happens with other disorders. Um, this uh, type of response to these, what we may call humoral therapies has always been associated to the idea that maybe humoral factors uh, and, and among them autoantibodies could be causing or participating in the disease process in these disorders. Indeed, from the very early descriptions of the pathology of, for example, in this case, Guillain-Barré syndrome, we know that uh, the, in, at the initial stages of Guillain-Barré syndrome, the first event that happens in the proximal nerves is uh, the appearance of edema without, in the absence of cells. So the first pathological process appearing in, in this uh, paradigmatic inflammatory neuropathy is independent of the presence of inflammatory cells. And this means that probably a humoral factor is the one uh, causing the, the disease or at least starting the process. And then the cells come afterwards. Uh, from the very early 70s, uh, we know that there are uh, some patients with GBS that have antibodies uh, against myelin components. Uh, this is something that many other authors have been describing afterwards with different techniques, but this is uh, almost 50 years ago and we uh, uh, already knew that there were antibodies uh, in, the, in the serum of these patients. And uh, from that early, from, from those early descriptions to, to now, uh, there are many descriptions of autoantibodies and autoantibody research in, in these uh, neuropathies. Uh, I would say that this uh, has been probably the, the most important topic of research in the inflammatory neuropathies, uh, at least uh, so far. And uh, indeed, this has allowed us to create a sort of a taxonomy of inflammatory neuropathies in which within the two a big spectrum of diseases, the acute and the chronic, we can find many subdivisions uh, depending on uh, not only the clinical findings that, that these patients uh, present, but also uh, depending on the autoantibody, autoantibodies that they associate with. Uh, this is getting uh, increasingly complicated because some of the ones that were uh, initially described, some of the antibodies, like for example, the paranodal that we are going to talk later, that were initially described in chronic uh, disorders are also present in acute onset uh, disorders, uh, making diagnosis a little, a little bit more difficult. One interesting thing of the antigens uh, that are the target of the immune response in these uh, inflammatory neuropathies is that they are usually glycosylated. We can find glycolipids, like ganglocytes is, is the paradigmatic one, uh, but also uh, glycosylated proteins like MAG or the saladation molecules. And sometimes uh, we can find just glycans that are shared across glycolipids and, and uh, glycoproteins. And these glycans, uh, for example, in anti mag neuropathies has served uh, as, a, as a model for for antigen-specific therapy in anti neuropathy. One thing that the field has, uh, uh, I, I would say, added to the overall field of immunology is this idea of molecular mimicry. I, I this is not uh, exclusive of 
uh, inflammatory neuropathies, uh, but I would say that in uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome, the molecular mimicry mechanism of pathogenicity is probably uh, the best described of, of all other autoimmune neuropathy, uh, autoimmune disorders. And, uh, and uh, in, in this case, as you probably uh, already know, uh, the presence of a, a, a lipoligosaccharide at the bacterial wall of the Campylobacter jejuni uh, that has a very similar structure to the GM1 gangliosite that is present in the axon of the peripheral nerves elicits this cross-reactive response uh, that in the end uh, ends up in, in, uh, in nerve pathology and disease, of course. This is probably the best example, the paradigmatic example of molecular mimicry and is in, in these neuropathies. And uh, these, uh, these anti antibodies that are associated with uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome uh, that are somewhat controversial sometimes because they are difficult to test, but uh, so you can see how relevant they are and, and how clear it is that they cause pathology. There are a number of, of case reports showing that a, a parenteral injection of gangliosides into patients for the treatment of radiculopathies, this was a, an old uh, practice that is not uh, performed anymore, uh, but in some of those patients, uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome appeared and this Guillain-Barre syndrome was uh, associated with gangliosaid antibodies. So meaning that we have a human animal model to demonstrate that these antibodies are indeed pathogenic. Uh, one thing that is interesting in, also in the field is that the isotypes of the, of the antibodies are relevant uh, for subclassifying the, the patients. Now, this year that we all know how a normal immune response works because of COVID, uh, we know that IgM antibodies usually appear in the acute phases and IgG antibodies appear in the chronic phases of, uh, of any disorder, uh, being it infectious or, or autoimmune. And, uh, and this is not exactly what happens in inflammatory neuropathies. So for example, if we take the GM1 <coughs> gangliosite, it can be associated with two different diseases, one chronic and one acute. The chronic is multifocal motor neuropathy, the acute is the Guillain-Barre syndrome, and it, it goes the other way around. So the acute uh, disorders uh, associate with IgG isotypes and the chronic disorders associate with IgM isotype. This is not only in GM1, but also GD1B, another gangliosate that associates with uh, chronic ataxic neuropathies or with uh, a sen sensory ataxic neuropathy, acute sensory ataxic neuropathy variant of GBS. The same happens. Uh, the acute variant is uh, IgG, the chronic variant is IgM, uh, that is kind of different of what happens in a normal immune response. Another uh, uh, Another uh, special feature that the chronic neuropathies in, in uh, an autoantibodies have in, in the field is that they usually, the IgM-mediated neuropathies associate with uh, monoclonal gammopathies. And this is for, for this disorder, but also happens in other uh, antibodies like anti mag neuropathies. In the recent years, we have seen uh, that uh, to flourish uh, another uh, field of disorder that is called autoimmune nodopathies. Uh, so this is the node of Rambier. This is a beautiful structure. is uh, uh, essential for the statutory nerve conduction, but also is essential for the binding of the Schwann cell to the axon. These are the paranodal loops of the Schwann cell. This is the axon, and we have a complex of proteins here that uh, sticks the Schwann cell uh, to the axon. And uh, it, it turns out that this uh, structure is relevant not only for functional uh, uh, properties of the nerve but also for structural properties of the nerve. And uh, the first uh, one to see uh, that some patients had antibodies against these structures was Jerome Devaux at Marseille, now at Montpellier. Uh, but there were patients with either uh, the Guillain-Barre syndrome or with CDP that had antibodies targeting the node of Rambier or the paranode of Rambier. This was later on uh, confirmed by many other groups and, and we and other uh, groups uh, across the globe uh, detected antibodies uh, against different uh, molecules in this, in this area. Uh, antibodies against contacting one were described first and, and neurofacin 155, then also Casper 1. And even though they don't cause uh, uh, the inflammatory neuropathies, but, but uh, cause uh, neuromyotonia and limbic encephalitis, Casper 2 has also been described as an antigen in, in this area. And also other uh, older antigens that we already knew, like MAG or GM1, are also playing a role in this uh, relevant structure that is the node of Rambier.
The important thing of autoimmune nodopathies is that they not only are a pathophysiological mechanism, but they these antibodies identify specific groups of neuropathies with specific phenotypes. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail, but just uh, bear in mind that these can be aggressive inflammatory neuropathies. So it's not that they present as a chronic neuropathy, but sometimes they may present as an acute neuropathy or a GBS-like neuropathy. And they may associate uh, to features like nephrotic syndrome, uh, uh, cranial nerve involvement or respiratory involvement, tremor for some of the antigens. But what I would like to highlight is that they have therapeutic implications because usually they do not respond well to uh, intravenous immunoglobulin that is the standard therapy for these, uh, for these uh, disorders. Uh, again, going back to the isotype, all these disorders uh, have so all these antibodies that, uh, that uh, target a uh, node of RAMBIA antigens uh, are usually IgG4, not exclusively, but most frequently IgG4. Um, this is uh, strange for uh, autoimmune disorders as uh, IgG4 isotype is supposed to be anti-inflammatory. It does not bind complement. It does not bind to uh, cell receptors. So uh, in these cases, uh, the pathology has to be caused by the antibody itself. We will see some examples later. But this also has therapeutic implications because I said before that uh, IVIG was not working in this in this uh, isotype or at least in these autoantibodies. And uh, but these IgG4 diseases usually respond well to rituximab. And, and uh, this works for every uh, of the subtypes that I mentioned. But here we have norofastin 155 in which uh, uh, even when resistant to conventional therapies, to corticosteroids or, or to IVIG, these patients respond really well uh, to uh, rituximab and the titers go down uh, to zero. Uh, the neurofilament levels also uh, decrease uh, significantly and the, and the clinical response is obvious despite being resistant to other therapies. And in, uh, another thing that the, the field has brought lately, lately is that uh, we were used to uh, classifying the pathology of the nerve in these disorders into demyelinating or axonal. Uh, demyelinating was uh, 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 only uh, referring to uh, segmental demyelination. But the description of these antigens uh, that are at the paranodal uh, loops uh, uh, prompted the, the discovery of this other uh, type of pathology in which you can see here in Merino Fasting 155, this is the normal conformation of a paranodal loop attached to the axon, uh, while when you have these antibodies, this is detached. Uh, there is no complex here to bind the paranodal loop to the axon. And this happens uh, in a similar way in contacting one patient. So this type of uh, demyelination that is not segmental is something that was not obvious before the description of these antibodies and this it's something that has been described recently. Indeed, as I said, uh, we understand in these disorders demyelination in two ways. We understand electrophysiological demyelination, and this uh, we can see clearly here, and also a segmental demyelination here. But these patients that have clearly uh, demyelination in the electrophysiological sense, at least uh, the paranodal uh, antigens have that, uh, do not have segmental demyelination. They just have this other um, detachment of the paranodal loops uh, from the uh, from the axon. Uh, these antibodies, at least the ones uh, that uh, were uh, described first, and this is contacting one, uh, are pathogenic. Uh, they uh, cause pathology in the absence of complement uh, uh, when transferred in an animal model, in this case a rat. So they, dis they bind to the paranoid, they disrupt the paranoid, and they cause uh, a neuropathy that is very similar to what happens in patients. And this is for contacting one, IgG4, but also uh, for neurofastin 155. Uh, in, in this case, the, the antibodies do not disrupt the, the, uh, paranodal, uh, the, par the paranodal structure, but what they do is to prevent the incorporation of neurofastin 155 into uh, the paranodal, uh, the, the contacting Casper neurofastin complex. And in the end, this, uh, this uh, absence of uh, the paranodal complex uh, results in a neuropathy uh, that again resembles the neuropathy that patients have uh, when, uh, when studied electrophysiologically and clinically. Uh, we are talking here about uh, acquired diseases. These are autoimmune disorders, so probably we believe these are acquired disorders, but they have a strong genetic background. We described a few years ago that neurofastin 155 patients uh, associated with the DRB115 class 2 HLA, 
and uh, this was almost 80 percent now uh, and this is under review now but more than 90 percent of the patients with antineurofasting 155 uh, associated to this hla so it's an acquired neuropathy it's a, a something inflammatory but it has a strong genetic background uh, we don't know which is the trigger that uh, the, the environmental trigger that is uh, also necessary uh, for this neuropathy to appear. And into another interesting fact is that is that this HLA is the same one that associates with multifocal motor neuropathy, that is another demyelinating disorder, and also is the same HLA that associates with multiple sclerosis, that is uh, another myelin disease, uh, although not a neuropathy, but another myelin disease. We don't know what that means. I really think that there might be something, the way Swan cells or maybe oligodendrocytes present uh, uh, the, uh, antigens, but uh, we don't know yet, and, and just, uh, uh, a curious uh, uh, finding. And finally, uh, this is work that is under review. I said before uh, at the beginning that uh, Guillem Barre and, and CDP were heterogeneous from the clinical and the pathological perspective. This is um, a heat map with uh, autoantibody reactivities against different structures in the, in the nerve. You have here all the patients in Guillem Barre syndrome that react to gangliocytes, but then uh, we still have. Uh, apart from an heterogeneous immune response in all the patients, we have a clusters of patients in which we don't know yet the antigen. And for example, we have here patients that react against myelin from large myelinated fibers. And this is exactly what 50 years ago was already uh, described. And we don't know yet uh, which antigen do these patients have. We'll still have to work uh, to see uh, if we find this antigen. Uh, here you have another example of the heterogeneity of the immune response uh, in autoantibodies in uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome patients. Uh, and this same thing happens in, in CIDP, in which we have antibodies against motor neurons, DRG neurons, and Schwann cells. And most of the of these patients, we don't know yet we, which is the true antigen. So uh, we still have work to do uh, to, even if I, uh, if we can be convinced that all these patients will have at some point another uh, autoantibody that is yet to be defined. Uh, and this is the case for not only CDP, but GBS and multifocal motor neuropathy and, and neuropathies associated with monoclonal gammopathies. We still have more than 50% of patients in which we don't know which is the target antigen. And this is uh, what I hope will keep us busy in the upcoming years. And with that, I will just would like to thank uh, again, the organization for inviting me to talk about this topic, the lab uh, that is doing all this all this work, and uh, uh, also uh, the the unit in which we are embedded that provides uh, expertise and patience uh, to our to our uh, experiments. And thank you all again for for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Louis. A fantastic talk, very interesting. Actually, the first question is the same one I was going to ask from John Bone, and it's about in a normal practice when you're seeing an acute GBS case, and it is like, should really we be doing the paranodal and nodal antibodies in everyone with GBS because influence treatment? And if not, when should we be thinking about doing them? Yeah, that's a good question. So I think if you have them available, uh, it, it doesn't hurt to, to do them. I, I also understand that it's not widely available. Uh, so if you see some uh, feature that deviates from what you expect in a GBS, I, I certainly would do it. For example, patient that keeps worsening despite therapy. For example, th there are some guidelines that will come up uh, soon, uh, hopefully, uh, on GBS and also the antibodies are present. But what I would say is if you have uh, some of these features that we've described, like nephrotic syndrome like uh, for example uh, tremor uh, or poor response to to conventional therapies or the patient keeps worsening despite therapy or worsens uh, uh, more than four weeks after uh, the the weakness has started then I would certainly do the antibodies um, maybe not for everyone also if you have a clear anti-gm1 positive patient with a post infectious uh, you, you know start etc probably that also, it's clear, a pure GBS and does not need to have the, the antibodies done. It's quite interesting, though, to think of those patients we've seen over years who got nephrotic syndrome with their GBS. I suspect in retrospect, there may have been some of them. There's another question. I'm not 100% sure, but I think it's asking you um, whether IgG4 is found in the paranormal regions when pathological studies are performed. Yeah, that's a good question. So we, we don't perform the, these pathological uh, sections, but in the COIKE paper, the one that describes the paranormal disruption uh, in, in anti-contacting one, they describe uh, IgG4 deposition, yes. Okay. And maybe I can ask you another one because I've always wondered about this. 
So why is it with the anti-GM1 antibodies and anti-GD1A that it's the IgM that's the um, chronic and IgG that's the acute? I just never got that. I I don't have an answer to that. It's, it's something very intriguing. Um, I I certainly believe it, it may it has to do with uh, with how the immune response to glyco to glycans is is set and uh, uh, inability to switch uh, into IgG because uh, it's probably. Uh, much more difficult that a T cell uh, generates a, a, fol a lymphoid follicle that is the driver of the mutation, the, the um, you know isotype switching, etc. So this inability to uh, bring CD4s to the immune response uh, keeps the response going into a. a B cell that is stimulated by the antigen itself only and not by a CD4 that is coming also. And this uh, probably is also the driver of, of the monoclonal gammopathies that are as well. So it's a, a B cell clone being re-stimulated constantly by the same antigen without the uh, appearance of a CD4 uh, maturating this response into IgG. But I, I, I don't really know. Okay. Uh, it's an hypothesis. And the absolute final question now is, that, do you see any complement mediated damage in IgM mediated pathologies? Well, you do, and this is, well, Hugo Willison could answer this question much better than me, but but yes, uh, there are some studies uh, and, and even some uh, clinical trials uh, trying to address this, this idea, but in theory, IgM is a good binder of complement, and there are some... Uh, some uh, experimental evidence that both, not only GM1, but also in the GD1B, uh, uh, that complement can be causing the pathology, yes. Okay, well, thank you very much, Louis. And